Robert, uh, pressing through, uh, Leroy, and, and guys, thank y'all for pressing through because there's they're strength as we gather. Today, we enter in a new series that is entitled Message to My Church, and it's the message, the letters that Jesus wrote to His church in the book of Revelation And the title of today's message is The Church Eternal. The Church Eternal. You know, man can set laws to shut the church down, but man can't shut the church down. He can't. Because we are the body of Christ, and we are the church eternal. And I want you to be encouraged, because as I was driving in, Today, just seeing cars coming around these houses of worship that have been there for decades and seeing people come back together and to gather to worship the Lord. Just bless my heart. The church is eternal. Jesus loves his church. So when Jesus pours forth his whole life for his church... And demonstrates his love, not with just words, but with action. Calls us his body. Not only that, he calls us his bride. Don't mess with the church of Jesus Christ. Because he loves his church. If you have your Bibles today, the scripture that we're going to focus in on is Ephesians chapter 5, starting with verse 25. And here is a scripture that many um, wives have quoted to their husbands, right? And all of us have heard before. And it reminds us not only of the dedication that allows 65 years and 50 years to happen, but it reminds us of the love that Jesus has for his church. Ephesians 5 verse 25. Husbands. Love your wives however you feel like. No, I didn't say that, right? Kind of fit her in when you feel like it, right? Now, this is a bold, bold (laughs) scripture. And and it's scripture to enhance, not take away. Husbands, love your wives as church, (laughs) as Christ. Love the church and gave himself up for her. Again, the standard of how we as husbands are to love our wives is the standard that Jesus shows us how much he loves his church. And it doesn't stop there. It goes and it gives great clarity. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the what? The word. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she, speaking of his church, that she might be holy And without blemish, Jesus is dedicated to his church. Jesus is focused to love us with all that is within him. And and here's something that that happens in a relationship. A relationship is not just one-sided, is it? Shouldn't be. When, When love meets together, love doesn't seem to extend very long unless it comes from what? Both sides. But I know this about Jesus. Even when we mess up, even when we do not give the love that he deserves, he continues to love us. But the problem arises with this, is this awesome reality of who we are, the church eternal, If we allow our minds to envision us as something of different value, it will affect the way that we love Jesus. So 
here is the statement that if the church is ever neglected, meaning we do not value who we are, it affects how we relate to Jesus. As I said last week, you are not the church alone. No. In fact, the Bible tells us this. We're living stones that come together to make up his holy dwelling, to make up that spiritual house. So we cannot be the church individually. We can't. So that is why under this present attack of devaluing church, we must be wise to what the enemy is seeking to do. I heard a a statistic uh, the other day that when this first happened, where we were told, don't meet, stay apart, that many churches started utilizing the, the Internet which you know the internet has probably been one of the things that has devastated our culture more than anything else. However, even in its demise and hurt, it still has value. And I firmly believe that the internet is one of the ways that God is spreading his word so that no no man will be void of having opportunity for his word. But here's here's one of the things that happened. Since Easter, 40% decline in how many people are going to church through the internet. It's a lot. It's a whole lot. So we have to be guarded to not let what society is telling us to devalue the precious gift called the church of Jesus Christ. Again, we alone are not the church. We together are the church. So so keep that in mind. Know that there is a a sneaky and a deceptive attack to devalue what we are as the church of Jesus Christ. And guess what? (laughs) What God makes is going to remain eternal. Will people fall away? The Bible tells us people are going to fall away in the last days. It's going to get more difficult to be what we we are created to be. But in that, purity is going to arise and come. We look again at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. As Christ loved, The church. It's easy to say, I love you. It's real easy to say that. It's another thing to have actions that show that I love you. And we know this. We as people, we have frailties and failings. We have faults. So our ability to love is limited in our flesh when our flesh begins to take control. But we also know this, that the church of Jesus Christ is filled not with their power, with the power of man. We encompass the power of Christ in us so love can be extremely genuine and true. It can be filled with actions. Love that is alive, not dormant. Love alive with the steps of Jesus. See, when Jesus said, I love you, as we look at this passage today, we're going to see actions of what love really looks like. It's not just something beautiful to look at and say, those are great words to hear, I love you. We see how much Jesus loves us. And the enemy wants to do all that he can to distance our vision of that action of love so that it devalues us. And as we feel devalued, we devalue and dishonor the love that is extended to us by Jesus. You are mightily loved. You 
our love with the fullness that God has to give as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. What does love do? Love is willing to pay a price, a cost. Love is willing to put self aside and step out in ways that honor others and encourage others. In fact, think of it this way. Who had more than Jesus? No one. Because Jesus is God. The creator of all the universe, encompassing all things, all power, all wisdom, the highest place of, of, of any of, of all things. Yet he said, I love you so much, I will forego my place in heaven. I will leave heaven for you. And I, I will do this. I will walk as you are. In fact, I will become what you are. Can you imagine that? And, and, and it wasn't that, that man was in this condition of perfect Adam, right? No, he came in this earth after this earth had fall, fallen. And he took on the same stuff that you and I have. And, and, and you say, how, how can you say that, Pastor? Because the Bible tells me the same temptations that any of us have ever gone through, Jesus has gone through. Yet, here's the amazing thing. Though he went through it, he did not sin. And, and, and he knew the feelings that you had yesterday. He experienced them. He knew the temptation that you had last week. He knew the struggles that we all went through. He knew, and he was willing to cast from heaven and walk upon this earth 100% God, but also 100% man. Now that is love. That is giving yourself for someone. And then we see in verse 26 of Ephesians chapter 5, that he might sanctify, say that word with me, her. That he might sanctify her. The church is the bride of Jesus Christ. A bride that is not cast aside, mistreated, abused, forgotten. No. He calls the church his bride to show us the commitment that he has. And when he looked at our condition, he saw there must be a sanctification that will come. And, and here's the thing. Why sanctify? What does that really mean? When Jesus looks at us, he sees the intent of why he formed us. Adam, from the very beginning, and Eve, were to walk in the presence of God every day without the, the wall in the bridge of our, the the. the the valley of sin in the way. Without death being in the equation, Adam and Eve walked in liberty from sin. But then they sinned against God and then separation came. And what Jesus did was I'm going to bring the pieces back together and you, Dominique, you are going to be what I intended from the very beginning. You are going to be a place for the dwelling of Almighty God. In fact, Dominique, the beauty of it is that now He dwells within us. He's not at a distance. Because He sanctified us as the church, we come together prepared for the indwelling of His Spirit within. He sanctified. He cleansed 
he made ready what our intentions or what his intentions were for us from the very beginning. You ever made a mistake and you really hurt somebody? Just messed up. Somebody looking at me real mean right now. (laughs) We all have, right? And, And one thing about the elephant, I heard the elephant doesn't forget, right? And that's, you know, that sounds good in a kid's book or something. But there's some studies that have shown somebody that mis- abused an elephant two years later coming back around that elephant and paid a big price. Yet the elephant was nice to everybody else, but the elephant remembered. We have memories that are good about keeping records of wrong. And when we messed up, When we have hurt, it's very difficult for us to let go. But not for Jesus. When he looks at what we have done against him, he says, I am going to sanctify, I'm going to cleanse, and I'm going to prepare you to be the dwelling of my spirit. Having cleansed her, When we've been offended, do we really want to forgive? Or do we want to hold on to that record of wrong as a way to kind of hit somebody back for how they hurt us? This question. You hurt me. I remember that you hurt me. I forgive you. But I'm going to keep this club called what you did in that that backpack. To bring it out at the right time. Thank God that is not how Jesus cleanses us from sin. When he cleanses his church and readied his church to come together, the past was totally forgiven. When we come together, it's not like a collection of all of the garbage that we've been through. No. It's not like we enter this gathering with God looking at all of the past mistakes that we've made. Now, let's be honest. Sometimes when we come around people that have hurt us, we got to press through saying, you know, I I have forgiven that, right? Because we're all going to what? Mess up. We're all going to do things that we regret. But how refreshing. When someone truly just forgives, it's a good thing. We are imperfect in that, but Jesus isn't. So regardless of what has happened in our past, our mistakes, the cleansing power of Jesus totally, totally forgives. That's how much he loves us. Because we are his church eternal. No laws of man are going to cancel us out. No fear of virus is going to cancel us out. In fact, from the very beginning of the church, there was all kinds of things that we could lock our fear upon. But it ain't going to cancel us out. It's not. Y'all say amen. It's not. (laughs) It's not. It's not. And then verse 26, here we see the actions of the love of Jesus by the washing of water with, say it with me, the word. By the washing of water with the word. What does that mean? You as a saved, born-again believer, have an ability, have an ability that nobody else has. And when I say that, born-again believers. You can go to the greatest schools, theological seminaries. You can, you can go wherever you want to grow in your knowledge. But unless you are born again, 
this gift of being washed by the word of God will be at a distance. Because when we are born again, the Holy Spirit enters in to this vessel. And the goal of the Holy Spirit is not to just tag us and go. Say, sealed, see ya. That's not what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit enters in to this temple and grows greater and greater in His expansion within us each and every day. And one of the ways that He does that When we pick up this Bible and we say, Lord, this is living word. I'm going to ask you this question. What word has come upon your hearing this week? When I say word, what words of man have approached your hearing entered into your mind and sought to seed deeply within your heart. There's a lot of words going on, right? There's only one living word that transforms us and washes us, and that is the Word of God. So Robert, when you pick up the Bible, it's not that All of us are going to be reading massive amounts. Some will, some won't. And that's okay. But it's how we approach the Word. We say, Lord, when I open the Bible, speak to me through Your Word. Say what I need to hear to be washed this day. And as I read... Open my understanding, not that I just know it, but empower my steps that I may live it. And may, when I walk away from this word, know that I've been washed and I have been nurtured and fed the bread of life. It's amazing what the church has This ability for the one who has created all things to build more and more in us through His Word. God isn't done with creating in us His image. In fact, the church looks like this. It is the fullness of who Jesus is. And we're going to talk about that further as we go through this study. And that is only possible by a living process of revelation that comes by being washed with the water of this word. Thank you, Lord. Ephesians 5.27 All of this love, all of this preparation, sanctifying, cleansing, washing us with his word... What's going on here? There's a goal. Ephesians 5.27, it tells us this. So that he, speaking of Jesus, might present the church. We are not forgotten. We're not. We're not forgotten. We anchor our hope in the love of man. We can be forgotten by the love of man. But we will not be forgotten by the love of God. See, God has an intention for you, Leroy. God's intention is to present you as part of His church. And He's going to present it, as we'll see further, to Himself. Because you are part of the bride of Jesus Christ. You know, I'm, a, I'm not a real macho guy. I said, bride, but you got to understand the dynamics, right? Jesus is the head. He is. Now, somebody would say, well, my mama was always the head. <laughs> Ooh, I'm, I'm not going to go there real heavily. 
Because some ladies are born alpha, right? Because my mama was an alpha. My mama was an alpha, but she respected my dad's leadership, and I would watch her sometimes. That alpha would be challenged, and, and, and she would just bring it out, and then she would just lift up. She lift up my dad with her alpha. She, she would. But Jesus is the head, and he looks at us with fullness of love as his bride that he might present us. So when I look at that, the presenting of us, the preparation for revealing to us, or revealing us unto himself, is not something that we have to worry about. Now here's, let me just touch on this a minute. When someone gets engaged, and, and again, ladies, men are so different with this. Uh, women think about their, uh, what, what they call it, the hope chest, where things are being prepared from being a little girl of when I'm going to get married. And, and, uh, and probably one of the first things that comes to uh, a lady's mind when they are called to be married is the dress, right? And it's probably been thought about many times before. And then... We got to do this, we got to do this, we got to do this, we got to do this. And eventually, she's frazzled out getting things ready to present that special day. I, I learned this when Barbara and I got married. Is I came up to Rochester, she's looking at me like, ooh, you better be careful. When we got married, uh, we were living apart prior to marriage, uh, South Carolina to Rochester. And I went up about a week early before the wedding. And after I went up, you know, the preparation process was intense. And here I am sitting down in South Carolina. I was like working, getting our home uh, together, our little apartment together, building furniture. And I go up there and, man, it was intense. And, and I've, probably, I've told Barb this before. I said, I wish I would have come up about an hour before the wedding. Not that they, they had me do anything, but I saw the stress that was upon them with the preparation and thank God we had a team of people that really helped but here's the thing what we are being prepared for is not weighted on us if you look at how this love is expressed who is actively preparing us Jesus so we don't have to get frazzled or fearful about being the church, God is going to give us everything that is needed to be presented to Him in a way that will delight His heart. So we don't have to worry if we can. He can. That's the thing. When you feel like giving up, don't give up. Hold on, because someone is holding you. Jesus is holding you. And then we must think in our minds, if we let go, what are we going to grab a hold of? And I tell you this, it will be nothing like the love that Jesus gives. It will be nothing like the power of who, Je of who Jesus is and what he provides for us. And then we go to verse 27 again in Ephesians 5. So that he might present the church to himself. <laughs> Let's get on in here with your raggy clothes on. No, didn't say that right. Are you just lucky to get in here? You just made it by the skin of your teeth. Hurry up and get in here and stand behind me. No, no. To present himself to himself. Let me, let me read again. So that he might present the church, which is you and I, the coming together, the gathering of the living stones, his bride, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor. <laughs> Can you imagine the anticipation in the heart of Jesus for the church being brought fully into his presence. See, Jesus 
is excited about this season ending. Many people right now are thinking, Lord, are we in the final steps of the return of Christ? Don't know. But this is the craziest year I've ever lived in. And it's, it's crazier beyond just what we see. There's a whole lot of stuff going on. And I know this. All it takes for us to enter into eternity is, is a stopping of this heart. It can happen at any moment. So we can think, oh, that ain't, it ain't right. Those things have happened like this all along. Don't think of it that way. We have one life upon this earth. We don't get duplicates. We don't get reincarnated to come and try again and do better. No, one go. And then I, I would look at it this way, God. If this is the latter day church, and when I say latter day, the really latter, latter, latter day. How am I going to handle it? Well, it's going to be all right. Because it's the strength of Christ handling it in us. I love how he, he, he said to Peter. Peter, when you get old, people are going to lead you to places you don't want to go. Where did Peter, he did not want to go to the path of rejecting Christ and denying Christ. But guess what happened? He went there, right? He didn't want to go there, but he went there. And Jesus told him, Peter, when you get old, it ain't going to be easy. You're going to be led to a place that you do not want to go. And guess what? The prophecy was fulfilled. Peter, a faithful man of God, the rock that the church was built upon, was in prison in his latter days. And he was led, church history tells us this, he was led to be martyred, to die for Jesus Christ. For his faith. And church history tells us. Not, it's not in the Bible. But church history sets a standard. That as he was approaching the hill to be crucified. He said I am not worthy to die in the same manner as Jesus my Lord has died. So when you place me upon that cross. Turn me upside down. Feet Upward, head downward. And that's where he was led. Where he did not want to go. But he was willing to go there. And he did it, not in his strength, but in the strength of the Lord. Are we ready for persecution? Are we? The church is under tremendous attack. But I tell you this. Jesus doesn't need us as his lawyer. His life establishes the authenticity of his love. And what he's asking us to do in these days that are surrounded with division and hate, he says, love God, love people. Not with your love, but with my love. Don't fall into the dividing fall into the unity of the church of Jesus Christ. We need the church. We've always needed it, but we need it more than ever right now. And, and here the enemy is throwing stuff and, and, and trying to birth hate at levels unspeakable. I ain't worried about it. Now, now hear me out. I know that the love of Jesus dwells in those who follow him. And it ain't a love that judges people through the standards of man. It doesn't. It doesn't. And as we draw and live what we were created to be, we won't fall into the deception. You know what we'll fall into? 
is the will of God to navigate and be His church. Where is the light coming from? Where is it coming from? It's not coming as we talked about last week. It isn't going to come through government. It's not going to come through the legal system. It's not going to come through the journalists. No. The light is going to come through the church of Jesus Christ. And you are that eternal church. So celebrate. Learn through the journey and see what God does. Because He is preparing you so that He might present the church to Himself, not in shame, but in splendor. And what is splendor? Splendor is the fruit of grace applied. Somebody could say this. You know, I did some really bad things in my life. In fact, some of them were last night. I've done some really bad things in my life. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to clean up my act. I'm going to clean up my act. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to pay my tithes. And I'm going to work harder than anybody else in the church. I'm going to clean up my act. Now, Do pastors like it when people come to church? Yeah. Pastors like it when people pay their tithes? Of course. And and by a testimony, we're hanging in there. You look around and say, how? By the faithfulness of the body of Christ. We're hanging in there. We didn't have to reach out to the government to step in. Okay. We're hanging in there. Because whose church is it anyway? It's God's church. And thank you, church, for listening to the heart of Christ. (laughs) Lord. Without blemish. The church is the instrument of healing in such a time as this. And you know what's going to happen? When people use the church as instruments of division and hate, there's going to be a special place for them in hell when they do that. In fact, I, I heard a testimony years ago. I read this book that was about someone that... Now, again, it, it, it appeared to be true because we test by the word the things that are presented to us. But this person wrote a book how for a number of nights he was visited by Jesus and Jesus would take him into hell so that he would witness what was happening in hell and give a word about the reality of hell. Now, you know, how do you test something like that? Look in the Bible. Can things like that happen? What his report of hell, was that in line with Scripture? And what I read, it was all in line with Scripture, about what Scripture says about hell. But one of the interesting things that were mentioned, because the Bible says this, don't desire to be teachers in the church, in my church. Now, he's not saying we don't need teachers. We do. But he was given a warning. He says, if you want to be a teacher, a a pastor, you're going to be judged at a stricter standard. Because guess what? You're standing up in my name saying things that you think I think. So you better watch out because you're going to be judged at a stricter level. That's intimidating. But when God calls you, when God calls you, you you can't reject it. I mean, you could, but not a wise thing. But here's the image. As he went through hell, he noticed certain torment at different degrees and, and demons 
that were celebrating in different ways. And what they celebrated the most is when they held a preacher in torment and belittled him, tormented him at a higher level. And they called out how he claimed Jesus. He pronounced Jesus and he was, a, he was, he was not true in his faith. So here's the thing. Do not treat the bride of Christ with disrespect. Do not use the body of Christ as an instrument to divide and to sow hate and, 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 and bitterness. And, and church, I'll just be honest with you. When I get riled up about stuff, I step off the line. And I get in the flesh, and I hate it when I do that, but, but I'm human, I'm going to do that. But the problem arises when the Holy Spirit convicts, and you don't listen. Then you just go further on the wrong, in the wrong way. Further, further, further. Does it change the pulpit? No, the pulpit's still throwing stuff out. But the heart has changed, and the message has changed, And what God had intended to be presented to his son, Jesus, becomes something totally different from the bride of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, 27 again, that she might be, say that word with me, holy, holy, prepared for the dwelling of God. Leroy, man, it, it, it's, it's a crazy world out there. We get, you know, you can get around some, some crazy attitudes. And, 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 you know, it's like this. Now, <laughs> now when we're out and about, we're a little bit more conscientious of what someone can do to us through what we never really thought much about. Oh, their breath may have something on, on it that can take me out. So, you know, here you walk around, and, and I see people at the store. They'll be walking, and then they'll see me, and then sometimes they'll do like this. And, uh, and, and you know, <laughs> Lord, help us do this. I don't like it. Had some guys do some work at the church, came, and they, they wanted to shake, you know, we, we wanted to shake hands, but then it went from, it went from this to this to maybe this. And, and I hate it. I hate it. Why is it that way? I'm fearful of what that person may have, right? I'm fearful of it. But here's something that we don't think about. When there's an attitude that dwells in my heart that isn't the attitude of Christ, yet it sounds good to me. I see some truth in it. I get a little closer to it. Get a little closer to it. Until it's got me. All Jesus wants to do is to prepare us through holiness to be in the presence of God forever. And there's a day coming, Leroy, we're not going to have to worry about missing it or hearing the wrong voice anymore. We're going to be made complete and perfect in His presence through what Jesus is doing now to prepare us for eternity. I'm excited. I'm excited. (laughs) That she might be holy. And then can we just say, thank you, Lord. Lord. And without blemish. I'm going to say it. Without blemish. Just think of how much. Stuff was put on faces today to do what? To get, get rid of the blemish. As I've gotten older, I'm, I'm getting things going on. I don't have, you know, my hair to cover up my head. And, and I look, I say, well, I guess that's just, that's another what? Blemish. I don't like it. I don't like it. But you know what? It's part of being... 
in this, this body that's decaying. Leroy, be proud of your blemishes, right? Yeah. But here's the thing. What Jesus is preparing us for. You think his, this is just like a subtle, poetic way without blemish. It's without blemish for eternity. And what does that mean? The garbage that I took my God through is forgiven. The evil that I let live out in me and towards others, forgiven. The mistakes that I made, gone, man. I'm not going to have to live in eternity looking in the mirror thinking, I'm sorry. No, you're, you're without blemish. And the thing that you're going to look at, you're going to look at the eyes of Jesus, and you are going to see the one that made that possible. And you know what? It's coming quicker than we think. Without blemish, the complete work of the love that Jesus has for his church eternal. I'd like us if we could bow in prayer this morning.